All right. Well, thank you everyone for joining us this evening. Um, we've got a really important topic to cover here today. So thank you for joining us. Um, Samantha Howland is the program manager um, for Immigration Legal Assistance Program at the Centra Health, uh, Care Alliance in Worcester. Um, she has a uh, master's in conflict resolution and refugee humanitarian emergencies from Georgetown and a bachelor's in political science from the College of the Holy Cross. Um, she's currently a JD candidate at the New England Law School and we're super happy that she could be here to, to talk about this. Um, we are recording everything. It's going up uh, live on Facebook as we speak. Um, we're going to put everything up on YouTube afterwards. Um, if anyone has any comments or questions, please feel free to put them in the chat and we will make sure Ms. Howland is able to answer those questions um, throughout the program. And if you have any other questions, you know, put them, put them there and we're happy to uh, answer them. So without further ado, uh, Sam, take it away. Thanks, Jim. Thanks so much. Um, uh, first, I want to thank the Dover Library for inviting me and hosting me so that I get this opportunity to share with you all. Um, and I appreciate all of you for coming, um, taking time out of your um, afternoon uh, to come learn about this uh, very important and very uh, relevant and timely topic. Um, as Jim mentioned, I work uh, in the Immigration Legal Assistance Program in Worcester. We also have an office in West Springfield. Um, and we represent clients, um, refugee and immigrant clients in their immigration cases. So we represent clients before the Immigration Court, um, United States Citizenship and Immigration Services, which is USCIS, the Board of Immigration Appeals, which is the appellate level after the Immigration Court. We um, help clients anywhere between having no immigration status all the way to citizenship. We have a specialized um, sub-trafficking program, and additionally, we have a um, sub-crime victim program. So I work with trafficking um, victims every day. Um, so this is something I'm really passionate about and I'm excited to share with you all. And I do wanna say that this is obviously um, a heavy talk topic, excuse me. Um, we will be talking about um, sex and violence. So if there is um, maybe younger ears or someone who might not have realized that we would be talking about those things, um, I just wanted to let you know that those topics were coming up. And as Jim mentioned, you're welcome to um, put any questions in the chat box and he'll um, bring them up as we go through. Uh, okay. Oh, whoops. Jim, how do I switch to the next slide when it's in the full screen? Um, Don't I, I guess, press I the, guess arrows? the Yeah, the arrows should do it. Oh God, it's not. Try, try okay. clicking on the screen first and then click on the arrows. Oh, there we go. Sorry, thank you, technical difficulty. <laughs> um, so today's goals, we'll start um, a little more dense and then get into more specifics, but we will talk um, about the federal definition of human trafficking, both sex and labor trafficking. We will understand where human trafficking take, takes place, both abroad um, and in the United States. We will discuss the connection between immigration and human trafficking, and then learn um, some of the forms of relief that immigration relief that are available for survivors of human trafficking. Um, my world is immigration focused. I understand that human trafficking um, overlaps in many other areas such as law enforcement, social services, um, prosecutory um, agencies, DCF, things like that. Um, and I understand that human trafficking happens to US citizens every single day. My focus and the focus of this um, presentation will focus on the intersection of immigration and trafficking. Um, so at the end, I have listed out some resources for those of you who might have more questions about um, domestic um, trafficking for um, US citizens. And then, um, so those will be available at the end. And if I'm able to answer a question, I'm happy to in the capacity um, that I can talk about. Um, so we'll just dive right in. Um, the, I will be talking about the uh, federal definition of human trafficking. Um, this was enacted with the Trafficking Victims Protection Act and then each subsequent reauthorization of the TVPA. 
uh, each state has their own definition of trafficking. So the Massachusetts definition is slightly more generous, although this definition is fairly generous and encompasses a lot of scenarios. Um, so there are a lot of words, but um, we will break them down. So sex trafficking, which uh, I believe is what is much more seen in the news. You, it's sensationalized on a lot of television shows. Um, but the federal definition of human trafficking that we use for immigration purposes is the recruitment, harboring, transportation, provision, obtaining, patronizing, or soliciting of a person for the purposes of a commercial sex act in which the commercial sex act is induced by force, fraud, or coercion, or in which the person induced to perform such an act has not attained 18 years of age. Um, we'll break that down a little bit more. I have the sub-definitions on the next slide, um, but uh, for this purpose, um, uh, someone under the age of 18 can't ever consent um, to a sex act. And then labor trafficking, which uh, I think people see less of in the news or kind of on um, the mainstream media is the recruitment, harboring, transportation, provision, or obtaining of a person for labor or services through the use of force, fraud, or coercion for the purposes of subjugation to involuntary servitude, peonage, debt bondage, or slavery. So in my daily work um, and in anyone who does work with human trafficking, um, you can have sex trafficking or labor trafficking, or you can have sex and labor trafficking. Um, so some people have experienced one or the other or a combination of both. Um, okay, and then these are definitions, a lot of like any, I think, person who asks a good question will be like, well, what does commercial mean? Or um, what are these more kind of opaque terms of debt bondage, things like that? So the um, US code has um, sub-definitions of um, some of these terms. Um, so commercial sex act being the first one for sex trafficking is any sex act on account of which anything of value is given or received. So of course, the most common or the most obvious is money um, in sort of a transactional, like I pay you for sex scenario. But we deal with a lot of other things besides money. Sometimes it's rent or clothing or jewelry or a safe place to live. Um, anything that has a commercial, that could have a commercial, so a monetary value. And Sex Act, um, we've argued things that were not um, just sex, but a sexual act such as pornography or um, any type of sex act that can fall under, um, that you can envision. And then involuntary servitude is another one that we see commonly, but is a condition of servitude induced by means of any scheme, plan, or pattern intended to cause a person to believe that if the person did not enter or continue in such Which looks like we had a little bit of a technical difficulty there. Oh, I'm sorry. What, what, Jim? There, there you go, Sam. We just had a little glitch, I think, but you're all good now. Oh, okay. Keep going. Um, and so we see this a lot with the threatened um, you, abuse of immigration authorities. So we'll go into this a little bit, but the most common one I see is the, um, the use or the threatened use of calling immigration authorities against a person to keep them continuing um, in either the work or sex work um, situation that they find themselves. Debt bondage is a, um, the status or condition of a debtor arising from a pledge by the debtor of his or her personal services or those of a person under his or her control as a security for debt if the value of those services as reasonably assessed is not applied toward the liquidation of the debt or the length and nature of those services are not respectively limited and defined. So again, we'll go into this more, but I commonly see this as a client um, consents to paying a smuggler, which we'll discuss, um, let's say $5,000 to bring them to the United States. Um, and the smuggler says, you can work it off when you get here. But then when they get here, that $5,000 gets charged 100% interest and then fees and fees and fees are added on so that they can never escape the debt. So they're essentially um, like bound to that person for this debt that they can never pay off. And then finally, 
not finally, but the other sub-definition is coercion, which is threats of serious harm or physical restraint, any scheme, plan, or pattern intended to cause a person to believe that failure to perform an act would result in serious harm or physical restraint against a person or the abuse of, uh, or the threatened abuse of the legal process. And I know this definition, um, while it's generous, it is dense. So one thing that we and many other agencies use to assess if a person is trafficked, and I don't be scared of the next slide, um, Jim is making it available after, but it's called the AMP model. It's the action means purpose model to assess if someone has um, experienced trafficking. Many clients that walk into my office and of course many other offices generally are not self-identifying as having experienced trafficking. Many people might say like, oh yeah, I have a debt or someone forced me to have sex um, so that I could get through Mexico or they're not identifying as I'm the victim of human trafficking um, and especially for my minor clients, so under the age of 18, um, many of them don't even know what human trafficking is if I tell them what is human trafficking. Um, so we break it down into little pieces. So this is um, essentially the trafficker using the action um, and the means for the purpose. And essentially you kind of, if you're able to select one from each category, it will generally meet the federal definition. Of course, you need to flesh things out. Um, I will not read, I promise, this whole slide to you. Um, but you can kind of see where, what is recruiting? What does that mean? What does that look like? Um, what is, you know, soliciting and patronizing are actually only for um, sex trafficking? What is transporting? And then what is fraud? Um, so sometimes um, a common scenario we see, especially with kids, but of course with adults as well, is people will, and we'll get more into this, but people will, um, intentionally look in certain communities in other countries and they will say I promise you you can come to the United States you can graduate high school you can get an amazing job um, and you can have this amazing life and then kind of that five thousand dollar agreement um, turns into this debt bondage situation or um, you know a forced sex scenario to pay off a debt so for all our clients whether they come in just because they might have a um, a parent who can apply for them, to someone who comes in not knowing anything that they're eligible for. We assess all our clients and we assess all our intakes for trafficking. Um, not every provider um, does this and we'll talk about relief that's available for, um, at least for immigration purposes, but we um, assess all clients to make sure that if they meet the definition of trafficking that we can provide them services through our trafficking program um, so we can connect them with other service providers like mental health or whatnot and of course um, our trafficking program is free of cost to our clients so um, this will be available you can of course look it up online the AMP model is like an assessment tool um, to identify if someone has been um, the victim of trafficking. So Jim, I don't know if it's a good time to ask for kind of definition questions before we go into scenarios. Um, yeah, so far we're good on questions. Okay, awesome. So with this dense definition and this um, kind of, might, you know, you might think, well, I would never see such a thing. Um, these are where we see common scenarios of sex or labor or sex and labor um, in the United States en route to the United States and abroad. So these industries um, are where a lot of trafficking occurs. So um, construction sites, um, agriculture, landscaping, domestic work, um, of course, prostitution in a, like the illicit economy. Um, but the ones that I see the most commonly are like landscaping, gardening, domestic work, whether it's a house cleaner or a live-in nanny, um, escort services and forced prostitution, and then um, also in the restaurant industry. And again, sometimes it's, um, someone might agree to take a job, but not, and then their employer will say, or their boss, oh, well, I'm paying you less to work here because you don't have any status. 
which actually would not be trafficking. But then it's like, well, why does the person stay in that situation? And maybe it's because their boss, which will each slide's building into the next one, but maybe their boss has taken their passport and is regularly threatening them that they're going to call immigration authorities if they don't keep coming to work for less than the agreed upon amount. Sorry, oh, okay, perfect. Um, so many clients enter into scenarios, or clients, many people enter into scenarios willingly, and sometimes it turns as it goes on. Um, so, you know, some again, the transit option um, or the transit scenario where people agree to be smuggled um, into another country can turn when they're in a safe house and someone says, well, now you have to have sex with these people in order to move forward. Or you have to, um, I have a client who agreed to be smuggled and en route they said, you have to dig ditches for seven days to do this manual labor in order um, to get to the next part. And if you don't, you know, we'll kill you or we'll kill your family. So these things um, happen, massage parlors, I imagine, I'm trying to think, um, there are some, at least out here in Worcester, that pop up overnight and shut down in a very short period of time. Um, sometimes people come in on um, like au pair visas or H2As, which are farm workers, and they get put into really scary situations and that they can't um, get out of them. And trafficking happens in both licit and illicit economies. So we have clients who are forced to or were forced to deal drugs or were forced into prostitution um, under really serious threats and dangerous situations, even though those are illegal actions. I mean, we have clients who had actual um, jobs they entered on to be au pairs or they were working in a legitimate restaurant um, and it has turned into a trafficking situation. So we always like to ask a lot of follow-up questions and really get an assessment um, of what is going on. And then some of the misconceptions, and I think what makes it harder for people to identify or reconcile that trafficking happens is um, some of these misconceptions. So trafficking does not require transportation. You can be trafficked, you can be born in Massachusetts, live your whole life in Massachusetts, um, and be trafficked in Massachusetts without ever having crossed a state line or an international line. Um, smuggling is where you're crossing a border and trafficking is happening against the person. Another one that I really like to drill down is half my clients are minors, so under the age of 18. Um, trafficking, both sex or labor or a combination, can happen to adults or children. It can happen to men, women, um, individuals who identify as transgender, um, homos homosexual, heterosexual, um, bisexual, asexual. Um, it can literally happen to anyone. As I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, it happens very frequently to US citizens. Um, my focus is non-citizens. And um, trafficking does not require physical force. Um, we went over what is fraud and what is coercion. I think sometimes the media does a really big disservice when they when they dramatize um, on like law and order or whatever, um, these really um, egregious scenarios, which of course do happen, but I think that sets a standard um, for what people think that trafficking is when it can be very different than that. And um, there can be times when there is no violence involved, um, no physical violence. Um, and many victims do have freedom of movement. Many don't. Um, but sometimes people are able to go out into their community or they go to school or they, you know, work a, like a regular job and then they're going home to a trafficking situation. Um, traffickers, you know, you see taken or something like that where there's someone, um, you know, a total stranger is kidnapping someone, which again, that happens. But many times traffickers prey on people they know, whether it's their family member or someone from their same community. So there are people who specifically target um, people in their home town or their home village um, because they know that they can sell a, an idea or a dream, um, even if that's, you know, they know what they're getting themselves into. So we see a lot of times family members having some complicity, com some being complicit or involvement. And 
as I was talking before, sometimes people do initially consent to whatever the situation is. And that is not relevant to whether they were trafficked or not. And sometimes people say, oh, well, they should have known better. What did they expect would happen? Um, even if you're aware of some level of risk, if you're a minor, right, and you're coming from, I, I deal primarily um, with clients from Central America, but even if you're 16 and you are aware that there are risks en route to the United States, um, you're not consenting to being held in a safe house and forced to have sex with people just for safe, safe and air quotes, passage. Um, and as I mentioned on the previous slide, it happens in legal and illegal industries. So just because someone um, is, is um, let's say arrested for prostitution, that doesn't mean that they aren't also being trafficked. And we advocate a lot to get those, um, those charges vaca vacated, um, or at least uh, advocate for that to happen because sometimes police in the initial interaction aren't aware of the whole situation. Um, so Sam, we do have a couple of questions yeah. now. Um, sure. You talked a little bit about the when um, it happens, you know, you don't have to have crossed state lines or ever been anything like that. Um, how, how is it that that is happening? Like, what is it that is being held over somebody's head that they would continue to, you know, go to school and work, but then, you know, be in that situation? Yeah, so um, if someone is threatening to kill a family member, um, so with many similar tactics to child, like child abuse or child sexual abuse, um, you know, children still go to school um, and pretend like everything's fine because they've been threatened that, um, you know, they'll get harmed or their, their mom or their sibling will get harmed. Um, in instances of clients that I work with, it's that we'll kill your family in home country. Um, or if they have children or whatever, there's usually a tie to home country. Um, so even if they're not physically moving across state lines, which again, many people do, or international lines, um, it's the, the threat of a harm to someone else, a harm to themselves, or um, kind of a positive threat that like, if you do X, Y, and Z, like I'll give you your passport back or you'll escape from this debt. Okay, and so then uh, that sort of ties into another one. Um, this, these are usually groups of people? So tra they can be very organized um, trafficking rings. Uh, sorry, is your question, are the traffickers groups of people? or? Yeah. Okay, yeah, so there can be organized um, trafficking rings, uh, of course. There can be kind of smaller ones, and then even like a spouse or a parent can be a trafficker. Um, so that's kind of like a more one, like one trafficker to one victim. Um, so it depends. It depends. Yeah, and so it, that's um, the question we had on Facebook um, with the Jeffrey Epstein um, things right now. How would you categorize Giseline uh, Maxwell? Um, they're, they're all traffickers. Every, everyone that's part of it is... is... Yeah, so I don't uh, want to speak too much about cases that I don't have all like the details about. I think, um, yeah, I, I would say if... if if she was uh, kind of a, like a driver of these things or a facilitator, then most likely, but I don't want to speak about cases that I don't have all the details on. Right, yeah, no problem. Cool, thank you. Okay, awesome. These are great questions. Okay, so, oh gosh, sorry, I have to click this again. Okay. Um, so, as I mentioned, sometimes, um, Kids are still going to school. People are still going to work. People are working in um, like valid jobs. Um, so sometimes, and clients generally do not self-identify. So how do we or other service providers identify and interact with human trafficking victims or survivors? Um, so we, in our program, screen everyone. So sometimes when we ask questions, um, you know, people laugh or they're like, that's a crazy question. And we try to explain that, you know, we ask everyone, we try to make them feel comfortable. We don't interview people uh, generally with someone else. But some of the signs, if some of you are um, doctors or teachers, um, some of the signs that um, people can exhibit, although not everyone, is 
um, signs of being controlled, um, an inability to move, an inability to leave a job, obviously signs of physical abuse such as bruises, fear, anxiety, or depression, lack of access to documents such as passport, driver's license, social security card, um, birth certificates, um, even immigration documents. I've seen traffickers um, hold on to things that ICE or the immigration courts give clients, lack of money, um, the person is never left alone, um, a person answering questions on behalf of someone else. So we uh, hear about that a lot in the emergency room, like a client maybe has gone to the emergency room three times and you know, it comes out like, oh, the person always posed as my boyfriend and I was never able to answer any questions. That's generally why um, we, for our trafficking program, we never interview someone with another person. And even generally for our regular intakes where we don't know someone, we either interpret ourselves or use a language line. Um, and then another scenario that it can be common is the person not knowing where they are. So um, it might be that they are, they can't identify what their address is or what state or city they're living in. Um, and sometimes that can be because they're moved around so frequently or they are intentionally um, kind of locked in so they're, they're not really exposed to the outside community. Um, and in terms of where we are here, other people answering questions is in kind of these serious scenarios of the emergency room or a doctor's visit, a police station, accessing public benefits, or at a school. Um, whether it's a legal guardian or a parent um, enrolling the kid in school and saying, yeah, everything's fine. Or like, oh, I don't know why that kid made up that story. That's crazy. Um, so sometimes like if the, the individual is not given their voice and um, then that's how many times things are hush at least. So we try to really dive deep, especially one, especially if we feel that a client has experienced trafficking, we really try to dive into these questions to flush out even more. Okay. Way, so as we're talking about this, we've touched on some of them, but ways, so as Jim, one of the questions um, that someone asked about, why do people stay in these situations, especially if they're not being moved? Um, one of the biggest ones we see is this financial obligation um, that they've agreed um, to a debt and the terms of that debt have changed so substantially since when they agreed to it. Um, I see regularly people charging 100% interest every month and I try to explain to my um, clients like, that is impossible. Like if you do the math, and math is not my strength. So um, I get out a calculator and I say like, if you add a hundred percent to this every single month, like no one could ever pay this off. But many um, people in a very honorable way feel an obligation to pay off that debt, even if those terms have changed. Um, so they do stay. Um, traffickers often keep the, the victims isolated, um, not letting them interact with public the public or other people or monitoring that interaction. And so sometimes that is answering those questions like I mentioned, or sometimes it's those threats that if they say anything, they'll take action directly against the victim or the victim's family or loved ones. Um, similarly, cutting off ties to family members and their ethnic or religious community. Um, sometimes it's like you can only hang out with my group, whether that's a racial group or an ethnic group, a linguistic group, um, especially if someone doesn't speak uh, English. Um, it can be very hard to self-advocate, especially if it's um, a less common language. Um, so isolation can be huge. Keeping these important documents, passports, visas, immigration paperwork, driver's license, birth certificates, um, whatever it is that they think will give power over them. And if you don't have any form of ID, um, it can be very hard to access services. Um, threat of violence, we've discussed that one. Another one that we see in certain, not all the time, but sometimes is the threat of shaming or exposing a victim, especially in sex trafficking scenarios, especially in cultures, um, which are many, where um, sex is taboo um, or sexuality, or and it would be very shameful to have had sex with other people or um, where there is shame surrounding sexual assault or rape. 
um, that is another way that we see people kind of complying with it, especially if there's like a promise at the end of leaving or getting money or whatever um, kind of promise people are making. Um, and especially in this day and age, the threat of immigration authorities is very, very real. We see this in so many cases. Um, I've seen traffickers call the police, the actual police on victims, or also they like say they've called immigration. Um, and that's a real fear for people because um, it's compounded not only the fear of being deported, but the fear of having spent that 5,000 and this is, you know, 5,000 is a made up number that I'm using for this example, but you know, 5,000, you know, they still owe that money. Their family's mad that they didn't make any money and send it back. Plus they've, let's say, experienced sexual violence and they're ashamed. So it's like a multi-layer um, of ways that people can be controlled. And then um, another one we see a lot of is kind of this idea that the trafficker is a loved one. Um, so the trafficker poses as a boyfriend or a girlfriend, or a family member, like I'm gonna, I'm your aunt, like you have to do these things for me, or I'm your best friend, or something along those lines where they feel a like relationship connection to that person um, so that they stay because of those feelings. Do you find that um, there is a Stockholm syndrome with any of them? So I'm not a clinician, so I don't know if I, I could diagnose it, but I do see a lot of people who feel some sort of attachment or they don't want to get the person in, they don't want to be in the situation, but they don't want to get the person in trouble. Um, or they often don't say bad things about the person. They might say like, oh, I, like, I don't understand why they did that because, you know, they told me they were going to help me. Or like, I don't understand why they did that because they're my family member. Um, so maybe um, someone with more clinical experience could, uh, could I... I don't know, identify that or diagnose that, but I do feel, I do see people who have attachments, yes. Yeah, cool. Um, and then there's um, another one, uh, during large events like the Super Bowl and things like that, um, is there really a higher rate of, of, of cases? So from everything I've read, yes. Um, I will, at the end, I have Polaris Project, which it, they operate the National Human Trafficking Hotline, and they're kind of experts, especially in domestic trafficking. So I believe they have some articles about that, but uh, yes. <laughs> um, especially in environments where people, um, maybe people think at the Super Bowl, you're gonna have a good time and you're gonna go to a party and it's okay, you know, it's normal to hire a prostitute, let's just say, um, or go to a strip club in that kind of environment without understanding that maybe the people that are doing this actually are not there of their free will. And as you can see, there might be some people who are there out of their free will if they're an adult consenting to the commercial sex ads. Um, but, you know, I don't know if people are asking that question when they're making, um, like when the buyer is making that decision. Yeah, but it, it sounds too like there's a lot of people that have been convinced they're there out of their free will when really they've yep, been. Yeah, that can be, that can be hard too. <laughs> so, all right, great. Other questions? Nothing else here right now. All right, these are so good. Okay, so um, my um, focus is immigration and human trafficking. Um, trafficking is not exclusive to the United States or exclusive to other countries. It is a global problem. Um, if any of you are interested, um, I put this link to the State Department's Office of Trafficking in Persons, or it's not the Office of Trafficking in Persons, but the Trafficking in Persons reports each year the State Department issues them in tiers countries by um, like a, a low problem and a high problem in terms of how much or how frequently trafficking occurs, what type, what resources are available, what laws um, exist, what kind of prosecution, um, things of that nature. Um, so if you're interested in a specific country, um, that's a really interesting resource. So all of these scenarios that I've described, all of these situations happen abroad and in the US. Um, many countries have less or fewer laws or um, institutions and infrastructure to deal with it. Um, some do, and um, so trafficking can happen abroad. We see many clients who are fleeing trafficking in their country or escaping from a situation of indentured servitude 
or kind of this debt bondage or um, they've been sex trafficked. So sometimes people leave that and come to the US, right? So the trafficking happened in the past. Um, and I would encourage you to, if you have time, <laughs> to look at those reports. Then um, another common scenario is immigrants who elect to come to the United States, they um, end up being trafficked en route to the United States. So what does that mean? Um, sometimes a client will agree, I'm gonna go on my own or pay a guide to bring me to the United States, let's say from Guatemala, they're in route walking or taking the bus through Mexico. And in Mexico, the trafficker has them at a safe house or a house, um, it's not safe. And they say, okay, now you have to have sex for the next week so I can make some money and we can keep going. Or they force people um, to cook and clean these houses or to sell drugs. Or I, I gave the example of digging ditches, like whatever was needed, like why that was needed. Um, either for continued safe passage to pay back like an additional debt for staying in that house or just because they can um we see it in other places clients will often say like oh i sort of agreed to it because i didn't have any money um and they told me you know this is how i could um get passage we've seen also where drug cartels who um they are kind of in control of the transit route in specific areas, will also make people either pay or work um, with the threat of death um, in order to keep going forward. This is not exclusive to happening in Mexico. Um, it happens anywhere, uh, I, I think, um, anywhere in, where people are migrating through. So sometimes Northern Africa, Eastern Europe, um, these are common scenarios as well. And it's not exclusive to those places. And then finally, in the United States, everything I've already described, um, if you have any US citizens who never left, um, but also sometimes, you know, let's just assume someone was smuggled into the US um, or they arrived on their own and then they find themselves in a trafficking situation in the United States. Um, and there, there are protection frameworks for US citizens um, and there are protections of um, protection frameworks for immigrants. So whether you're a U.S. citizen or an immigrant, um, you're often, if you've been trafficked and um, either escaped or left or reported it, or sometimes during an investigation, immigrants are often overlapping with other actors. Um, law enforcement, um, like a DA's office or um, like uh, the attorney general's office, Homeland Security Investigations, ICE, Child Protective Services, um, DCF, which is Massachusetts's Department of Children and Families, um, different investigatory agencies and prosecution agencies, in addition to other actors who might identify them as having been the victim of trafficking, whether it's a legal provider like us or um, an emergency room, a doctor, a social worker, um, things of that nature. And then if an immigrant has been the victim of human trafficking, there is some immigration relief. So it, when I say relief, I mean some type of legal status um, available in certain circumstances. So um, these are scenarios, These are this is relief, excuse me, based on having been the victim of human trafficking. So asylum, it's very <laughs> timely, um, it's in the news a lot. Um, is a form of protection available for people who meet the definition of a refugee but are already in the United States. Um, for someone who's suffered past persecution or have a fear that they will likely suffer future persecution based on their race, religion, nationality, membership in a particular social group or political opinion. Um, so we have done cases where um, having been the victim of trafficking was both a particular social group and persecution. Um, it doesn't know that's not always a guarantee um, and asylum can be done if you're in deportation proceedings in immigration court or if you're not and you just apply on your like without having been caught by immigration and then the T visa exists it was created under the trafficking victims protection act is um, a form of immigration status available for people who have met the federal definition of human trafficking who are in the United States on account of that trafficking and who um, have helped um, in the investigation or prosecution 
It's not required. Um, not everyone has to report it. If you're a minor, um, you can be exempt. And in certain um, really extreme hardship scenarios, you can be exempt. There's 5,000 issued by Congress each year, and that has never been met, um, which might be, uh, there's just like, People are not disclosing some of these stories and um, practitioners are not identifying them. And then the U visa is a much more commonly available or commonly known, excuse me, form of immigration status, which is for available for victims of certain crimes who have helped in the investigation or prosecution. The crime had to have occurred in the United States, human trafficking, um, rape, um, um, certain sexual violence offenses um, and domestic violence, all all of those are qualifying crimes. Um, there's 10,000 issued by Congress per year. And right now they are, I just got an approval um, yesterday for one from 2015. So that's a five year delay, um, but we anticipate that, uh, we've heard that there's about 80 to 90,000 pending, which actually would be longer than a five year delay. Um, the U visa is a little bit, it's more generous in what crimes it covers, but you have to have the police or the district attorney or um, someone from DCF sign off that the person was the victim of a crime and um, helped in the investigation or prosecution. And that looks different for each police or DA's office. And um, we, so all of these are pathways to legal status and eventually a green card. Many of them have derivative benefits available. So you could apply for your um, children or parents or spouses abroad eventually. Um, in some instances, the trafficking beat the T visa, um, there's a more immediate available relief. And these are just based on trafficking. So we assess for all types of relief. So I have clients who have experienced trafficking who want nothing to do with the T visa, but they're eligible for something else. And that's what we pursue. We work with the client on where they're at um, and what they want to pursue. Um, so we, uh, we assess for these, we file these, um, but we really work with the client on um, what they're interested in pursuing and what they're comfortable with. Um, sometimes it happened in the past and they don't want to talk about it. Um, sometimes I have clients that it's taken three, four, five um, basically intakes for them. They keep saying like, oh, I forgot to tell you this, or oh, like, can I ask you a question about this? And in reality, um, it's just that they're getting um, the courage and the um, confidence to, uh, to feel safe talking to me or my colleagues about it. Um, so it, it can take time to even um, identify that people are eligible for these forms of relief. And either um, any one of these, there's some others as well, that um, can help terminate deportation proceedings, um, which is immigration court. And sometimes um, you're, you're working with two different actors. The T and the U visa is adjudicated by United States Citizenship and Immigration Services, which is USCIS, which is like an office. And asylum can be adjudicated by the asylum office or an immigration judge. Um, so sometimes you're walking two paths with a client um, and hopefully you're able to get status for them. In addition, these are immigration relief, so a form of status. But um, of course we refer clients to other areas, mental health services. Sometimes they need help with housing. Um, sometimes they need enrollment in ESL or GED or whatever um, services. It's not just that we're like, okay, we're gonna help you with your T visa and that's it. And we also walk a very fine line with clients um, helping them report and making sure that if we're walking into an ICE office or a Homeland Security Investigations office or a local police department, um, that we're able to advocate for them um, and make sure that doing that is, is safe. Tim? Yeah, so um, a couple of questions. Um, so the forms of relief here um, is, you said it, that you can go different paths. Um, you know, sometimes you're going both for asylum and the, the, the T visa or, or whatever. Um, is, is asylum, um, like a means to a green card if you once it's once you've achieved asylum then you would drop the other cases um you wouldn't need the t visa anymore or the yeah so aside like um generally <laughs> um so asylum is a way once you want asylum you eventually can apply for a green card um 
So if you're applying for two things concurrently, um, once you have a permanent status, you can withdraw the other one or say like, I've gotten my green card or whatever the situation is, yeah. Yeah, and um, somebody asked is, when seeking asylum, is sexual orientation um, offered by, uh, protection by the law? Right now, that is a um, recognized and generally winnable basis. It depends on where you're from. Um, you know, if you're from Uganda, um, where it's illegal, like their law is it's illegal, um, like homosexuality is illegal. Um, but if you were maybe from England or like Canada, for example, it would really be fact specific as to what happens. Okay. And then um, how, how often do traffickers get caught and prosecuted? Um, I don't know the statistics on that. I can say from the clients like I work with, it's really low. Um, or they might get prosecuted for something other than trafficking. Like they might get, they might, um, you know, get like a wage payment violation that they pay, they pay back wages or um, they get arrested for something else or they don't get arrested at all. Um, so again, at the end, I, um, actually, we can just click to it. I have um, this slide for some of these questions about rates of pros um, convictions or whatnot. Um, Polaris has really good resources um, in terms of like statistics. And then um, I would say like what I see is very low and I think in general it's very low. And then you had talked the, with the U visa about um, it took, you know, five, you know, five years, the, the one that happened in 2015. In, in general, is that about how long it would take for, I, not just for the U visa, but for any part of the process? Yeah, great question. So U visas, we here are taking about eight years right now. So if you file one now, it's about generally eight years. Um, that's even to get it approved. And that just gives you a non-immigrant, so a Kind of non-permanent status it's a four-year visa and then after the third year there's other qualifications you can apply for a green card the t visa right now is taking about 18 to 24 months to get a decision and again you could get four years on a visa and then after the third year depending on certain there's other qualifiers but you can apply for the green card asylum um once you've had an approved asylum for one year you can apply for a green card um, asylum is a little harder because there is the, the comment period for the proposed regulations for asylum um, recently ended. Um, but as maybe many of you have heard in the news, there is a huge backlog in the immigration courts. And um, so we, so if you're applying in the asylum office, um, we have cases pending for many years. Um, some get heard much faster. And then um, in the immigration courts, there are very long delays for asylum. Yeah. Um, so a little bit of a political one, but uh, given the current administrative's conservative approach to immigration, have you seen an increase or decrease in trafficking cases? Um, what I can say about that is we see a lot of people having more fear um, in applying for something. And do you, do you think that there is a correlation between the immigration policy and trafficking rates? I think, the, well, the, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Oh, oh, uh, wait, say that again, in immigration and trafficking. Immigration and trafficking rates, um, so um, going on. Sorry, I, that, let me backtrack on that. I thought you said in terms of applying for trafficking things. So I don't know, if, I don't know the answer to that question. I think what I can say is people, we've seen more people fearful of a, affirmatively applying for something um, because if it gets denied, well, one, they're kind of availing themselves like, hey, I'm here. Right. Um, and if it gets denied, there's a fear of being um, put into deportation proceedings. And I think, um, I don't know in terms of, is there more trafficking? I don't know, I'm not sure. Yeah, um, and then do you find that, um, is there is there any way to like do they expedite any especially egregious um, scenarios or anything or is it that they just take it case by case and as they get through them then they get through them and um so not for the T or the U visa that I'm aware of um 
for asylum, uh, if you're detained, um, so more so on the border, but um, they are very, very fast hearings. Um, if you are in the asylum office, generally you can request to be heard sooner. Um, doesn't mean that you'll get it. <laughs> Um, but no, there's, we, there, generally no. Yeah. You can also, in immigration court, you might request a sooner hearing um, if the judge's calendar allows it. All right, well, that's all I have for questions. If anyone else okay. has anything, put them in the, in the comments quick. Yeah, and these are just other resources that I um, check in with whenever I'm like writing something about trafficking or looking something up. Polaris, the first one, is um, kind of a nationally known agency. They operate the National Trafficking Hotline. They have tons of reports. Um, ACF, which is the Administration of Children and Families, um, op operates the Office of Trafficking in Persons. Um, so they have a lot of information um, about trafficking, especially minors, and especially immigrant um, minors. And then the United Nations, um, which again is not the same federal definition but and then cast LA which is the coalition against uh, slavery and trafficking in LA they do really amazing um, trafficking work and they uh, do a lot of immigration stuff as well they have excellent they provide a lot of technical assistance so um, we've connected with them um, and that's a great resource as well Um, yeah, so I'm happy to answer other questions. That is kind of an over overview, excuse me, um, of the overlaps between trafficking um, and immigration, what's available for immigrants in terms of immigration relief, and briefly touching upon other things like back wages or social services, um, depending things along those lines, um, and that it's not always what you um, see portrayed in the media. Sometimes it's um, a lot more out and about. Um, it just takes a lot of unpacking um, and analysis to really see um, that it meets the federal definition of trafficking. That was that was really great, Sam. Um, you know, that was it's such a big, important topic, and um, you did a great job of covering everything. And um, so, if anybody has any other questions. Um, feel free to reach out to us on Facebook and we will connect you with, with Ms. Holland and uh, hopefully she'll be able to answer any other questions. Oh, we have one last one coming in. Um, oh yeah. So <laughs> there you go. Um, we will definitely get you the contact info for, for Sam and um, her office. And so um, we just had somebody asking to be able to uh, connect with you. So. Yeah. And as a, as a program, we're always um, interested in one client referrals, but also partnering with other actors. Um, we were really grateful for the Dover Public Library for hosting me. Um, and we always are trying to connect with other providers, one who might be able to identify um, victims, but also to connect our clients with services that are needed. Yeah. Well, thank you again, Samantha. Thank that you all so much. Wonderful. Um, thank you all for coming tonight. Uh, we appreciate you being here for this important topic. So everyone, uh, Thank you all. You have a good evening. All right.